Welcome everyone uh, to this um, Karma webinar um, by Professor Kenneth Klutner on uh, macroeconomic research, um, past and present. My name is Renee Fry McKibben and I'm a professor of economics at the Crawford School <laughs> of Public Policy in, and Karma at the Australian National University. Uh, but before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on land on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders um, past and present. So this is a joint webinar between Karma and CSEN, and I would like to introduce Oza Karagadaliki from CSEN, who is also a research associate of Karma, and Benjamin Wong of Monash University, who is the co-director of the Model Uncertainty and Macroeconometrics Program in Karma, um, with James Morley, who is also on the screen. And there is also Wotan Kimen here, who is the director of Karma. So Ozer and Ben is, are going to be running this webinar today. So, but before I hand over to Ozer, I'd just like to let you know that this event is being recorded and will be available on the Karma website in the next um, few days. So if you'd like to ask a question, uh, please put it in the chat on the Q&A um, um, icon and um, I will um, make sure Ben gets that question to Ken or I will invite you on to ask the question in person if you would like to um, join the panel. panel. So um, over to you, Rosea and Ben and Ken. Thank you very much, Renee. First of all, thank you very much to Ken for joining us today, for uh, agreeing uh, to do this. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, but before then, may I say a couple of things? This is the uh, first event that the CSEN Center is doing with Karma, and we are very uh, happy with that and hope we can do uh, more of that. Uh, for those of you who might uh, not know about the CSEN Center, it is the Southeast Asian Central Bank's Research and Training Center, a, a regional institution established by 19 central banks of the region. And Ken is a, a friend of the CSEN Center who has been teaching in CSEN Center courses uh, for the central bankers for some time. Uh, and the last course was in the Philippines that we did together. Uh, uh, so uh, that's a few things about the CSEN. But uh, the man of the hour is uh, Ken, of course. Uh, Ken is uh, the Robert White class of 1952 professor of economics at Williams College. Uh, uh, but prior to that, uh, he taught at Oberlin College. And he also spent a significant number of years at the Chicago Fed and also mainly New York Fed. Ken has published a number of very influential articles, especially, at least for my interest, for my taste, three things, his 1994 article on the estimation of potential output in a Phillips curve framework, the Kalman filter, and more recently, his 2001 article, on monetary policy surprises, unanticipated components, and his 2005 Journal of Finance article with Ben Bernanke on the effects of monetary policy. It, those are all very influential, influential e articles for central bankers and the students of macro, and e, we are very happy to have Ken here today. E, with that, e, I will hand over to Ben, who will be chairing the session. Thank you very much again to our friends at Karma and Ken. All right, uh, thank you, Jose. And um, it's very exciting that we are trying out something new with uh, CSEN and Karma doing something. So Ken, would you like to share your uh, screen? Um, I'm really right. looking forward to the talk. Um, share the screen, let's yep. see. Hopefully the technology works. <laughs> yep, fingers crossed. Uh, Okay. Oh, okay. excellent. All right. So I that's um, about it. I'll just go uh, full. I'll just do presentation mode. How's yeah. that? Great. So <laughs> yeah, you are the main event. So please take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really, uh, it's really fun to be here virtually. I mean, I'd rather be there, of course, but it's uh, really a thrill to have a chance to discuss this with you. And as I, um, as I mentioned to Renee earlier, this is the kind of paper well, as you'll see, it's a very unusual paper. It's not at all the typical macro, not really the typical economics paper at all. Uh, it's the kind of paper that, um, you know, I'd be happy to have you jump in and make comments or, uh, you know, rejoinders or questions or whatever as you go along. So this is the kind of paper that may be even more amenable almost to a conversation than just to a lecture. Uh, so, yeah, as I said, this is a very unusual paper. I've never written a paper quite like this before and probably never, 
<laughs> probably never will. Probably never will again. Oh, and I should say, I should give credit to, I actually have three co-authors on this, uh, PJ Clandon, Sandeep Mazender, uh, and Caleb Straub. And these are all of the, these are all also professors at liberal arts colleges. And um, this paper grew, actually grew out of a, uh, a we, every now and, well, actually every year, macroeconomists at liberal arts colleges get together and have this annual conference on macroeconomics, but for primarily for liberal arts professors. And this paper came out of uh, when we had the conference here in Williams in 2016, and you know we had the after dinner, uh, we had the dinner thing, the dinner speech, and you know we're sitting around and probably had like a couple of maybe six or seven beers and uh, came up with the idea for this paper, <laughs> and that was that was five years ago, and uh, and so so here we are um, uh, many beers later uh, with this kind of very strange paper. All uh, right, let's see. Let's go to the next slide. Motivation. So the thing that uh, Caleb and uh, the other three, the other two guys and I were talking about over um, over drinks at the end of the conference was things like, you know, we, these are things we struggled with as macroeconomists. I need, to find a good, I need to find a good place for your pictures that aren't, it's not the, this is the, always the problem I have with Zoom is where to put, where to put all the windows where it doesn't obscure uh, what's going on. So it should dock up at the top. But it's not okay. So I'm going to put it. Let me put you guys over here. Hopefully, it won't cover. I might have to move you guys around so I see what's on my my screen. So the kinds of things we were uh, shooting the breeze over is, uh, and I experience this like on a daily basis. Is um, you know we get a macro speaker in, or uh, and most of my colleagues here at Williams are applied micro people, and so they're all about. And most of them are like from Princeton, and so they're all about. You know, they're all doing Angus Pishke stuff, they're all doing diff and diff, they're all doing sort of this applied micro business. And then we come, somebody comes in and presents a macro paper and they have no idea what's going on. Uh, like, why is this person building a model? Everyone's coming in with their own model. Uh, how are things identified? Why don't, I just don't get it. This is so unlike what they're used to. Uh, and it's, it's, like a foreign, it's like a foreign language to them. And every time, every time I try to explain what macroeconomics is doing, I, you know, I've never had much luck. And so, well, I'll, you know, I'll try to, you know, think about that systematically. Uh, and then, of course, we also are every, you know, every year we're hiring people. And uh, it's my colleagues who have no idea what macro is. are saying, well, is this person macro? Is this person not macro? What qualifies? And I always have a hard time because macro is so diverse. Uh, and it's become so, uh, in some ways, amorphous that I struggle to answer this question, too. Uh, which should I advise the budding, macro, the budding macro students to study? What classes should they take if they want to go to PhD programs? Which what are the what are the things that will get them ahead? Uh, and uh, a lot of people like to beat up on macro, even even macroeconomists. And so I wanted to understand kind of we want to understand why that was. And as an example of the beating up, I just have a selection of papers here uh, of people beating up. And actually, uh, Ricardo Reese particularly is defending macro. But you know, I can't think of any other field within economics that has uh, where people are writing papers with these kinds of titles. You don't see, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of any papers like the trouble with labor economics or the trouble with uh, finance or something like that. This, you, you really see this much more in, uh, in, in macro than anywhere else. And so what's going on? So here's our endeavor. This is what we set out to do, uh, this crazy scheme that we came up with. So what we'd like to do is say something about what macro currently is, how it's evolved over time, and maybe having done that, give some perspectives. This isn't the main goal, but it, we can then back up and say, well, what is it about macro that makes it such a lightning rod for some of these, for some of these critiques? So the first thing we did is we tried, we sort of sat down and created a scheme for classifying sort of figured out a whole bunch of attributes we wanted to classify and how to organize those in a way that was sort of make sense of, of, the, of the whole. And then we, we read 1,894 papers. Um, I use read in quotation marks because some of these attributes were easy to figure out what they were doing and very easy to figure out what the key attributes just on a very cursory read. Uh, others, we really had to read, like really from page one to page to the very end to try to figure out what they what they were doing. And I really came to, after reading eight, well, <laughs> we, we didn't, each of us didn't read all 1,894 papers. We split them up uh, strategically. But after having read uh, way too many papers, I came to appreciate uh, the art of writing a paper that is very clear and says right at the outset what the purpose of it is. Uh, and I really came to hate papers that say, 
in this paper we study blah 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 like uh yeah that's pretty vague so i like to say in this paper we are testing the following hypothesis it's like yes now you know what we're doing so we read all these papers uh, in a total of 10 journals, five uh, the top tier uh, pipe leading macro journals and the five top general interest journals from the years uh, 20, uh, 1980 through 2018. So we wanted to get a long perspective on this and, and you know, just to show you how old I am and, and Warwick too is, a, is maybe spans a, even a little bit longer time series. So that's, I entered grad school in 1983 uh, where I didn't when you entered way from like a couple of years before me work. So this is pr really pretty much spanning my professional career uh, during which time I've seen obviously macro evolve quite significantly. And then we catalog these characteristics, documented trends and uh, differences across journals. And we did some other stuff too that's actually not even on here that we'll get to at the end. So here's what the data set looks like. Uh, so this is uh, this is just showing you the number of papers in the uh, in the field journals. And what we did is we, as you can see from the dates, we did we took um, we sort of took decadal snapshots earlier on in the period, so 80, 90, 2000. Then we started uh, then we started getting taking inventory more frequently. Uh, 06, 08, uh, and then 10, and then we did it every one year from 16 through 18. Uh, the idea we wanted to collect as many papers as possible for the most recent period of time to get the richest possible characterization of the current state of macro, but we wanted this longitudinal, this decadal uh, longitudinal perspective too, so we went back all the way to 1980. Um, so even just looking at the numbers in the inventory, a few things are kind of interesting, uh, you know, so um, you know, just the sheer number of papers, you know, it was kind of like hanging out in the 70, you know, 70s, 70s, 80s in the, for, you know, for 20 years. And then there's this explosive growth in the early 2000s. And that's just in, uh, and that's just coming from the JME and the JMCB. And then in 2016, we added the newer journals or inventory, and then the numbers really explode. And so the addition of these of these field journals, which are relatively recent additions, the AJ and the JDC and the RED, we started a little bit before then, um, really just let, have led to an explosion of the volume of research in uh, on macro, as as we all as we all know, it's so hard to keep up with it. And then we also looked at the general interest journals. The uh, all general all, the first column is the all uh, combined. You have the AER, Econometrica, uh, JPE, QJ, and, and Review, of, Review of Economic Studies. And I should say um, we are okay. So this is what I have to explain a little bit. So in what is a macro paper? So are we define that as in, in several different ways for the field journals. Unless we, unless I tell you otherwise, a macro paper is what's pa what's published in a macro field journal. You know they uh, so we basically say okay well it was published it was published in the you know published in um, you know published in AJ Macro it's macro if it's published in the in RED then it's it's, it's macro. Uh, general interest journals obviously have a lot of non macro papers so what we did we limited our attention to the uh, only the E designated articles in the general interest journal. So we use the JEL classification to uh, to screen those and designate uh, E E classified journals. Early in 80 and 90, not all of them had the JEL code. So PJ did something very clever. He did uh, he basically inferred JEL codes from the from the keywords, and so he's able to match up uh, with pretty uh, high, with pretty pretty reliable if it had the following keywords, and it would have been classified as a, as an E. So he did this sort of a synthetic uh, E JEL coding for the early years uh, when we did actually, we didn't actually have them. And okay. interestingly, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, are you happy to take questions as we go along? I'm happy to take questions anytime along. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, so jump uh, in. Yeah, I'll monitor the chat for you. So uh, one of the um, participants asks, uh, is there any reason you are omitting other broader journals with uh, substantive publications on macros, such as, uh, say, the Cambridge Journal of Economics or the Journal of Post Keynesian Economics? Yeah, you know, so. Um, uh, yeah, journal, we actually, one of the referees asked about um, the, the journal, some of the you know, so-called heterodox journals, the J, the, like the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics. We were focusing on, uh, for better or for worse, on the, you know, the 
quote influential, the highly you know the highly ranked uh, journals by the usual by the usual criteria, um, and you know so the thing is something like uh, you know so one of the referees on this well, this is this is we this is uh, under revision uh, we have this you know, it's a revision we revised and resubmitted the JEL, and one of the referees said well what about the you know what about we didn't do a tabulation of heterodox papers like things from the um, Journal of Post Keynesian Economics. And I was like, well, the, the field is so sort of segregated for better or for worse that if you wanted to tabulate the number of sort of post Keynesian articles, there'd be zero in this set of journals. And then we just simply added the number of articles in the Journal of Post Keynesian Economics to get the number of post Keynesian economic articles. So for better or for worse, yeah, the, the kinds of research done in these, so these mainstream influential journals completely excludes these other, uh, these other heterodox approaches. I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure that's a good thing, but that's the, that's, that's the, that's the way it is. Uh, so that's, that's why we chose these journals, again, most highly influential uh, by the usual metrics at the expense of maybe giving a narrower view of what macro is about than, uh, uh, we would have if we included the, the, for lack of a better word, the non-mainstream macro journals. Right. I'll just monitor your questions. Yeah. So okay. Good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Good. So I have the the Q and A. I have the Q and A window open, but you, but nobody's doing anything in the Q and A. It's all going through you. Is that right? Yes, for some reason, but well, I'll, I'll look at it for more. For, I'll, I'll, I'll just interject when there's something here. Yeah. Okay, well, if, if nobody's yeah. going to use the Q&A window, I might just move that off to the corner so it doesn't, so it doesn't interfere. Oh, no, come back here. I'm just going to minimize that uh, and, or at least move it out of the way. Oh, now I, oh, okay, so now I just took up the whole screen. <laughs> okay, I'm going to make that as small as possible, put it in the corner. There we go. No, okay, good. All right, so the thing I want to highlight in yellow here is just sort of the, it's interesting pattern is that the, the number of macro journals, the ma number of macro articles in the general interest journals sort of had this, had this weight, had like in 80, it was like 60 something, and then it had fallen by half so in, in, the, in, the mid, in, the, in the mid to late 2000s. Um, so yeah, so they're like for 30 years when uh, interest in macro in the general interest journals was, I mean, the general interest journals weren't interested in macro for whatever reason. And then since 20, uh, since 2010, there's been, I won't say an explosion, but a huge, but a, a significant increase in the amount, the number of macro papers published in the general interest journals, which, um, yeah, which I, um, which maybe is indicative of a, of a renaissance somehow in, in macro or a resurgent uh, interest among general interest journal readers. I don't know, but it's a, uh, it was, we were surprised to see that waning and then waxing pattern of publication in the, in the general interest journals. All right, so let me go into this classification scheme we came up with. And this, this took a, 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 you know, we went around on this a great deal. The first iteration that we sent to the JEL had a much cruder uh, classification scheme, and uh, Steve Durlauf, uh, you know, took us to task for having something that was like really, really way too coarse, and the, and the referees too. So it's like, okay, well, back to the drawing board. And here's the scheme we came up with. So we have this. Um, I've always wanted to write a paper that uses the word epistemology. So here, here I am, a, a paper that uses the word epistemology. It sounds it makes me sound very erudite. Uh, and so one of the dimensions on which we're classifying these papers is what I'm calling epistemology. And epistemology, you know, uh, one dictionary we looked at, um, you know, in searching for a succinct definition, what distinguishes justified belief from opinion uh, is one way of putting it. I was going to dig out a quote from George Bernard Shaw, who, you know, has all kinds of, you know, all kinds, written all kinds of stuff on this, uh, on epistemology, but I thought that might be too pretentious. Uh, but the key, uh, as we operationalize the term epistemology, really the key here that we're looking for is the relationship between the theory and the data. So, you know, and this is kind of consistent with what, um, you know, uh, uh, Prescott uh, wrote this article that we quoted from, which is that uh, this, the, the way in which the field advances is this sort of feedback tree between theory and measurement. So, um, you know, I guess I would say that, uh, you know, the, you know, ultimately an empirical 
science, if you will, like economics is all about somehow informing the, uh, in using theory to inform the data uh, or using theory to shape how we think about the data and then using data to, uh, to test or to modify theories. So that's, you know, so our definitions of epistemology, which I'll enumerate in a minute, all have to do with the relationship between theory and the data and how that, uh, how the, how those two work together. And then the other dimension in this top level taxonomy is this dimension I call uh, methodology, which is simply what are the kinds of methods that are used to in this interaction between theory and data. And uh, I'll talk about this more in a, in a second, but this is just a two way breakdown uh, that I'm calling, I'll tell you what these means in a, in a few minutes, theory centric versus econometrics based uh, methods. So we have eight epistemological categories and then two methodology, methodology question, uh, uh, categories. Uh, but before going into the uh, before going into the that classification, I need to make a quick digression on how we're using the term model because a lot of it is you know we're talking about testing models, estimating models, and so on and so forth. So the way we're defining it, the models are uh, we define the term as something that's based on behavioral relationships involving economic actors. So you know so. Um, it would like a time series model would not be a model. This is if it's just like a, if you're estimating a, a doing Granger causality, that wouldn't be a model. Even if you're doing a structural VAR, that wouldn't necessarily be a model because the equations in the structural VAR, you know, don't really have an interpretation as, um, you know, as it may, may be underlying. You can motivate them by having, you know, the behavior of agents or individuals, but they're, they're not overt there in the structural VAR. So anything based on, or at least being advertised as being based on a behavioral relationship is something we're referring to as a model. Uh, nowadays, of course, we all know the only, uh, the only models that are viewed as legit are those with, with micro foundations. Uh, so we all know that, uh, but you know, back in the day, people would be estimating uh, structural models with equations that they interpreted as behavioral. So, you know, you read the general theory and Kane says, you know, it's a psychological law that, uh, you know, the consumption behaves in a certain way. And he says it's a psychological law, and just the same that people now say that, you know, a, util a logarithmic utility function is a psychological law, and, or a CRA, or whatever. And so at some level, he was, his, his interpretation of this function was, you know, was, uh, was as uh, describing a behavior of, uh, it, interestingly, this is just as an aside, we talk about individual agents and households, but Keynes described uh, his relation to his consumption function as representing the behavior of a community. And he repeatedly uses the word community in his writings, which I had never noticed before until going back and doing some reading for, for this project for my teaching. So I thought that was, I thought that was kind of interesting. So anyway, it's a, if you think of think of a uh, uh, think of a behavioral relationship involving a community as being a relevant economic factor. So, if somebody says, "Okay, well, I'm estimating a structural model, the Keynesian uh, consumption function, which was not uncommon in, in 1980," it's like, well, okay, so the author is viewing this as a structural relationship and viewing this as 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 uh, interpretable as a you know as a behavioral equation. Then, okay, I'm just going to defer to what the author says about that. And so I'm not going to be snobbish and insist that in order to be behavioral, it must have micro foundations. All right, so with that little digression of what a model is, here are our eight epistemological categories, which I'll describe in turn uh, on the next slide, but I am gonna just put a number nine other down there because you know there's ultimately gonna be some, uh, a handful of papers that do not fit in any of the buckets. Uh, so, um, and I'll tell you, give you examples of another paper uh, in, in a minute or two. So first of all, let's just go through the eight categories. Description is pretty straightforward. And, uh, you know, I'm just borrowing a, a, you know, pretty easy to describe what description is. But Hedman and Singer uh, in their paper that I'll reference in a, again in a minute, uh, has a nice succinct definition, uncovering new facts, providing rich descriptions of old facts. Um, yeah, and, you know, stylized or, other, <laughs> stylized or otherwise. And, uh, you know, an example, one of my, I'm going to put in a plug for my co-author, PJ Glandon, has a purely descriptive paper on, uh, on the behavior of prices, uh, you know, how prices behave in sales. And, um, uh, and so that's this kind of an interesting thing to know if you're somebody who's working on price dynamics, but it's no, there's no model. It's just like, here, here are the facts. 
causal effects. This is something that, um, yeah, I think that this is something that we probably would have paid less attention to 20 years ago or 10, even 10 years ago, but it has now become quite uh, salient in the profession after, you know, with the applied micro kind of analysis in the vein of like Angerson and Fishke and all those people. So, you know, the way I describe causal effects is very succinctly, you know, you apply some kind of a treatment X, does it have a discernible effect on outcome Y? So, you know, you administer a vaccine, you administer a drug, you know, does it have an effect on outcome Y? We don't need to build a behavior, we don't need to build a molecular biology model as to why that happens, but we just sort of throw the medicine at people and see if it works. Um, so in that sense, it's not quantifying or testing a model as we define, it's not a behavioral relationship. There may be one underlying it, but the, the point of causal effects uh, kinds of analysis is not about the model per se, but just to, it's really, you can think of it as maybe a reduced form uh, equation. Uh, but I guess, well, I guess you wouldn't say it was a reduced form because the, you know, the causal effects people are obsessed with is setting things such, uh, motivating things as an experiment and have, you know, sort of experimental identifying, so identify, theory free uh, identifying assumptions. And so arguing that, well, this, this law was passed randomly in different states or whatever, and this represents a natural experiment. And we're going to use that uh, as the basis for uh, determining the, co the causal effect of X on Y. Quasar natural experiments, the, the language is often used. So, you know, so if you want to learn about causal effects, you know, read Angers and Pischke, uh, the diff and dip stuff. Um, Interestingly, they, uh, you know, you can think about the Romer and Romer narrative identification as something like causal effect. Uh, so, you know, and in fact, Angerson and Pischke had an article in the JEP from a few years ago in which they have a, like a page where they talk about causal effects in macro. And they say, yeah, there's not very much of it in macro, but you can think of the Romer and Romer narrative, narrative identification as causal effects. So they, uh, I agree. And so we have, we have put causal, we have put uh, narrative, uh, the small number of narrative studies we have in the causal effects bucket. And event studies qualify too. So uh, an event study is essentially a causal effect kind of analysis. Um, this we, I agonized over this for some time. Then there's the question of structural vector autoregressions. I wasn't sure what to do with that. Uh, but then I went back to, you know, some of the, some of the early sources on structural vector autoregressions, like, you know, the early work of Christian Eichenraum and Evans, on, a, on the topic um, and they're going like, yeah, so we're doing this uh, structural VAR and we can think of that as essentially an econometric experiment, an econometric experiment. So we're using this, we're using this, you know, theory free identification, like, uh, you know, the recursive identify, the recursive identifying assumption and saying, okay, so this is not based on theory. This gives us a plausible sort of exogenous shock and a, a, a something analogous to a treatment, and we're gonna see, we're gonna trace through the dynamic causal effects of that shock uh, on, the, uh, on the outcomes. You know, and of course, Matt, you know, we all love to argue about whether those are in fact causal effects and you know, legitimacy of the identifying assumptions and so on and so forth, but you know, um, it eventually uh, I came around to the view that at least as originally envisioned, uh, the structural VRs are viewed as kind of and I, and I actually think the I believe the Christian Eichmann Evans article actually uh, actually in thinking of the, the handbook chapter actually calls it a sort of an econometric experiment. So that that was good enough for me. Again, you know, uh, our our philosophy in doing this is not to impose our views on what you know on whether this is in fact a legitimate to exercise uh, as a causal effect or whatever, uh, but to take as at face value the way, the way the, what the author is advertising it as. And so if the author thinks they're doing causal effects, we'll go, okay, so this is a causal effects paper. We may argue about whether it's legit, but if the author advertises it as such, then we'll, we'll, we'll go with what the author thinks they're doing. Examples of causal effects, put in a plug for myself. There's a, uh, you know, there's a classic event study. Uh, thank you for talking about the paper earlier, Ozer, appreciate it. Uh, and then you have a whole bunch. Uh, in the paper, I have a, a, a larger listing of um, examples, but you know, so here's just another example of a couple people uh, 
have some kind of a natural experiment on uh, 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 financial distress and argue that it's you know it's sufficiently exogenous they can think of it as a natural experiment. Uh, so falsification corroboration. So this is okay. So this is kind. Of, this is again, I think, pretty intuitive. I think we all are familiar with what this means. Um, so it's a style of research where you know you have a behavioral model, and you you know take in the data, and the data will give you an opportunity to either reject it and you know we force you to abandon your theory or or abandon your model. <laughs> to the extent that macroeconomists ever do that, or to uh, not reject it and uh, corroborate it. Uh, uh, so you, know, you don't reject it for the time being, but you keep, you keep subjecting it to uh, repeated tests uh, and uh, hope that it survives, then, then all good. And so this is kind of the way, you know, the, the, when sort of the, maybe the, the most common way to think about the scientific method, right? So you have the hypothesis and you confront it with the data and see if it, see if it holds up. So rejected if the theory implied restrictions are contradicted, if not, the model is corroborated. And again, uh, I have a behavioral in italics because I'm talking about a something that has an interpretation as the behavior of some economic actor, community, household, <laughs> individual. And so something like, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm a reduced form time series model where I'm, I'm testing for the exclusion of some, you know, some variable that could predict uh, why that doesn't really count. That's just a reduced form uh, econometric kind of exercise. So really, that has to be rejecting some behavioral hypothesis or uh, or corroborating. So you know, um, this is like classical Popper style um, uh, scientific method. Friedman, Milton Friedman, not Ben. Milton Friedman wrote about this in in, in his uh, in his stuff. Basically, it's like, well, you know, the model is something you can uh, you can that has predictions that you can either verify or allow you to falsify the the the, the model. And so, Friedman Friedman's writing is very much in the popper in the popper tradition. And uh, actually, the best, probably the most um, salient example of a falsification paper is uh, one of my favorites that I like to bring up is Hall's random walk uh, paper. His consumption is consumption of random walk paper. So he has a behavioral model uh, that he writes down, very simple that even I could understand it. And this is in 19, in my, my vintage, this is like, this is leading edge uh, when I was in graduate school. And, um, you know, so it has a very stark prediction and uh, then takes the data and tests it. It easily tests the random walk hypothesis. And, uh, you know, either you, either you reject it or you, uh, or you provisionally accept it. So the classic example, uh, a couple of, in our, these are just papers in our data set. Uh, so somebody is testing the Shishinsky and Weiss model of monopoly price adjustment. Somebody else is looking at the sort of the benchmark. Uh, these people are looking at the benchmark um, DSG model for the housing market. And I have on, in parentheses, this is kind of getting my head of myself, ahead of myself a little bit, but I'm indicating the, uh, indicating the, um, the methodology used for the exercise. And so, um, you know, in, since we can think of the methodology and the epistemology as kind of a grid, so the first one is something that would fall into the uh, falsification, uh, falsification econometric cell of the grid, and the second would be falsification and, and um, uh, and quantity, what I have written there, a quantitative theory uh, grid. Abduction. I had not, uh, I had, was actually not aware of this term the first time I, uh, in the first draft of the paper, and then Steve Durlauf uh, called my attention to this interesting paper by Heckman and Singer that uh, advanced this idea of abduction. Uh, and I thought this was pretty interesting and, and realized that it did in fact describe a lot of what's going on in economics. And in fact, the, I think the title of the paper is, or maybe the first sentence is, economists abduct. Economists abduct. They, they maintain that that's really what economics is, is, is all about. And my read of the Heckman and Singer abduction, uh, so they describe it as the process of generating, revising hypotheses and data in response to surprising findings. So I think the, you know, I think maybe a, a succinct way of putting that is these are puzzle solving papers. So somebody will say, you know, in this, uh, in the standard model, you know, predicts, you know, predicts A, but instead we observe B, 
So if it were just a falsification exercise, we'd just say, oh, okay, well, we'll reject the model, you know, reject the model and, uh, you know, and start from square one. But ab what abduction is that makes it a little bit different is to say, well, hmm, the, the baseline model can't explain this surprising finding, can't explain this puzzle. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out if we can, if we can work with the, uh, the, baseline, uh, the baseline model, figure out how to, to modify that in such a way that it can explain that surprising finding. So we operationalize that uh, when, when we read these papers, we're looking for these, the, these three criteria. One, does the author articulate a null model? Uh, so this would be true for the falsification paper too. Uh, then presents a surprising finding that contradicts the, uh, contradicts the null model. Okay, so falsification would, uh, would, you know, would contradict it. And then that would be the end of a falsification paper. But what distinguishes an abduction paper from a falsification paper is then the, the modification of the null model to account for the surprising finding. So the classic example that I mentioned in the paper uh, that I don't have on the next slide is, is the, that I think is a great example of this. Is, it's, it's works in my uh, vintage, which is the, the Mayhew, or is it Campbell and Mayhew paper on the rule of thumb consumption? So starting with a Hall random walk paper, they go, oh, um, consumption responds too much to current income as a puzzle. I know, let's introduce rule of thumb consumers. We put in rule of thumb consumers and voila, and now we can explain the time series properties of, of consumption and income. Classic example of, abdu of abduction uh, back in the day, more recent, you know, more recently, there are people, you know, taking the Calvo staggered price setting model and going, oh, that can't explain inflation persistence, you know, and so we're going to tweak the Calvo uh, price setting uh, model somehow and try to make it uh, fit, the, fit the data uh, in a way that the plain vanilla Calvo did not, you know, and uh, so here's another just randomly selected paper where the CES consumption expenditure model can't explain expenditure switching. I don't even know what this is on. <laughs> Honestly, I, was, I wasn't totally not familiar with this kind of with style of modeling, but I'll take your word for it. And uh, but then they they propose some tweaks to the standard CES consumption model to uh, to make it work. Model fitting, we all know model fitting. Model fitting is like a canonical, you know, sort of a canonical DSGE or RBC paper. We've all seen a million of these things. And we can all like, we can, the outline, you know, we can all, you know, we all, we all know the outline, uh, right? So the outline of the paper is like introduction, stylized facts, model, <laughs> and then we'll match the moment. So that's basically what's going on here. First, you establish a set of stylized facts. Uh, oftentimes those are like variances, covariances of uh, the moments of the macro variables. Or the moments could be something more complicated, like the response to monetary policy shocks. Uh, so that might be the, 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 the moments or the stylized facts that uh, the paper is setting out to mimic. Uh, then the next section of the paper, we're going to write down a model. And oftentimes, the section heading is simply model. And I tend to attend this model. So write down a model. Uh, and then fit the data somehow. And they're talking about later, there are different ways of doing this and you need to have the increasing sophistication, but you fit it somehow choosing parameter values to try to hit the moments, uh, get as close as possible. And the model is deemed success if it, if it nails the moments or get close to it. And um, it, uh, it turns out that this approach has been around for, um, for a long time. This approach has been around for longer than I've been alive actually. Uh, the first paper that uses this approach uh, was by Edelman and Edelman, 1959. And uh, so Edelman and Abel, they were taking the Klein-Goldberger model and simulating it on an IBM 650. Punch cards, I'm sure. Simulating an IBM 650 and then generating these artificial time series and then basically using an NVR dating algorithm to, uh, to get the peaks and the troughs and looking at the covalence between the variables and the leads and lag relationships and going like, oh yeah, we're getting, you know, we're getting peaks and troughs and leads and lags that are really just a lot like what we see in the data. Cool. How do I even know about this paper? Well, I remember like way back in the day uh, when Marty Eichenbaum was a, young, was a youngster uh, this is back at the Chicago Fed, and this is like the, during the dawn of the RBC period. 
And uh, Marty Eichenbaum was describing the RBC research agenda. He said, yeah, what we're basically doing is like, uh, you know, just like Edelman and Edelman did in 1959, and he sort of filed that away. It's like writing this paper, it's like, oh yeah, that's exactly what Marty Eichenbaum was talking about. And uh, so that's, they want to talk about model fitting uh, and uh, seeing if you can tweak the model to make it fit the, fit the moments, the stylized facts. Yeah, this is, this is standard, this is standard stuff going back 60, two years now so and another way of uh, another way of people like to describe that again going to Kindle and Prescott uh, these are quantitative experiments uh, Kindle and Prescott does define two kinds of quantitative experiments uh, this is like quantitative experiment a is that they call a quantitative experiment for developing theory so this is an exercise a model fitting exercise where they go like okay we're going to write down a model you know, see if we can kind of get it to fit the fit the data by tweaking the parameters, and then that's you know we can do that uh, that quantitative experiment, building the quantitative model that replicates the data. You know, and so you can yeah you can it's not hard to find model fitting exercises. You know, <laughs> all the going all the way back to Klein Goldberger. The only difference is some of them are you know some of the some of the model fitting exercises are sort of more econometrics based, like the Engel and West uh, paper I mentioned there, and some of them are like DSG kinds of exercises, like the Gertler et al. Uh, paper that I mentioned there. But I just like pulled them out of the hat because they're, you know, probably of the two thousand papers we read. Uh, well, I don't know, like some, I won't say a thousand, but a few spots of them were model fitting, fixing, model fitting exercises. Quantification, number six. So uh, this is something I say behavioral model because we're not talking about like a time series forecast. We're so using a behavioral model, advertised behavioral, to provide a numerical answer to some specific, uh, often policy related question. So uh, what's the effect of some tax on saving? What's the effect of you know, demographics on productivity or something? Oh, who knows what? So all kinds of different things you could answer. And uh, you, could, uh, you could pose Kinlan and Prescott. This is their quantitative experiment uh, B. Uh, they call this a quantitative experiment of using theory. So you have a quantitative model you developed and you fit it, and it's like, okay, so now we're going to use that to make a quantitative uh, prediction that we should take seriously as a serious quantitative answer to, uh, to an important question. So this is not just like kind of a like, oh, what if back of the envelope thing? This is like, okay, we really want to nail the optimal rate of inflation. We really want to nail the welfare cost of taxing, of imposing a capital gains tax, and we want you to take this quantitative, use this quantitative model to, you know, to get a, try to get a serious answer to that question. You no know, forecasting and reduced form exercises, again, emphasizing these behavioral models. And so a couple of examples, and these are really, these are really good examples. Uh, so there's this paper, um, you know, uh, calibrated labor search, equilibrium model, uh, and they nail the optimal rate of inflation at 1.16%. So this is great. This is not like, this is not 1.1, this is not 1.2, this is 1.16%. So that's, they really, they got a really precise estimate of what that is. So good, 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 good for that. That's the thing about some of these things is what, where's the confidence interval? But um, okay, so now we know the answer. Uh, Fair, uh, he is, um, you know, in Fair's mind, uh, this is like an old style structural model, but in Fair's mind, these are structural behavioral equations. And so we're going to put that in uh, where that counts as like a model as opposed to just a time series exercise. And, um, you know, so he tells us that the drop in wealth in, uh, after the financial crisis increased the unemployment rate by 2.1%. So another example of a quantification exercise, the first with a uh, theory-based uh, approach and the, other, the second with an econometric-based approach. All right, so those are the main ones. Uh, we also look at pure theory um, papers. Can I can I yeah. be a bit? Yeah, sure, can I be a bit yeah, of a? Sure. Yeah, so I'm going to be a bit of a buddy pooper and say that uh, ten. Uh, maybe try to wrap up in the next ten or fifteen minutes. Oh, oh! I thought I had like a. Oh shoot! Okay, I thought I had way more time. I'm sorry. So right, I'll go fast. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, I lost track of time. I was like going. I'm going to like really leisurely. Oh yeah. Sorry. Okay. So all right. So techniques. Other, uh, so what's another paper? Uh, this paper is another paper. Okay, 
econometrics-based, um, you kind of know what this is, uh, uh, since I've been alluding to it all along. So econometrics-based methodology, estimating parameters, confidence intervals, and so on. Uh, uh, the way I'm going to spend a little bit more time of my scarce resource, my scarce time resources remaining, uh, to talk about um, to talk about uh, talk about theory centric methodology. Because this is a really interesting distinction that really gets at the difference between what we are, so this new shift towards quantitative modeling. So computational experiments, not estimating parameters and testing hypotheses. Time series models are used, but only as flexible characterizations of time series behavior in calculating summary statistics. So the use of time series econometrics in this approach is completely transformed from what we have been used to back in the 90s and uh, really is just glorified summary statistics. Uh, Uli, uh, let me answer your question in, uh, uh, after, in the Q&A since I'm short on time. So epistemology and methodology, the interesting thing that comes out of this, which is perhaps not a surprise, is that these, the methods and the epistemologies are closely related. So if you're talking about, so of the papers that do falsification, 65% of those are econometric. Uh, some use both, they'll develop a model and then they'll estimate it and test it, uh, but through econometric methods. It's really hard to do falsification exercises in a purely quantitative theory approach. And we'll look at 3% of the theory-centric DSG-style papers do anything that would be referred to as falsification. So this quantitative theory approach, uh, not at all amenable to that. Model fitting, abduction, quantification are really much more uh, the dominant, uh, the, the dominant methodology, the dominant epistemologies for theory-centric methods. And look at this, look at this beautiful picture. This beautiful picture is just showing you um, really the, uh, the the decline of the non-quantitative theory, that dark blue area, the decline of the falsification, uh, the more econometric -y kinds of things, and the green down below, and the rise of the quantitative theory-based approaches, quantification, abduction, and model fitting. Those are all, those are, well, not entirely, but prim primarily this quantitative DSGE-ish and that flavor of modeling that are in that central, uh, that central area. Um, you know, the stuff across journals, I'm going to skip because I, uh, since I, I miscalculated the time, uh, just to note that the, the, these epistemologies vary a great deal across journals, do, do, do different journals have different tastes for these things. Uh, Q, the, I'm just going to highlight the outlier QJE does a lot of causal effects compared to the other ones. So if you want to, if you want to publish a causal effects paper, send it to the QJE is my advice. Falsification really low, bigger at the QJE. So interesting patterns across journals. Uh, skip that one. So that's, uh, and then having done this top level taxonomy, we then drill a little bit deeper and talk about the, some of the specific features of the theory and specific features of the econometrics that are that we find in the papers. Uh, so various attributes, I'm gonna go and highlight the ones that I think are most important. Uh, this probably is no news to anybody. No news whatsoever. So in 1980, you know, like it was 80% partial equilibrium, 20% general equilibrium. DSGs were not even a glimmer in anybody's eye at that point. Well, I'm going to take that back. I guess uh, Kipling and Prescott were even earlier, but uh, uh, no, the papers in we read in 1980 actually used the method. And then, you know, 50% now, and I'm sure the trend is only going to go up. Now, one of the critiques you hear is that macroeconomics ignore the financial markets. And uh, so we wanted, we, wanted to, we wanted to tabulate the papers that actually had some well-defined financial market imperfection or immediate in it. And yeah, you know, there's some, uh, there's some merit to that. The, you know, the share of models with any kind of financial market imperfection or intermediaries declined from 80 to 90. Why? Well, that's kind of, you know, when RBC modeling took off. And as RBC modeling took off, fewer and fewer papers uh, did anything with the financial sector. 
obviously that took off again after the financial crisis and now uh, you know it's over 40 percent of all the macro papers out there uh, have a financial some kind of an interesting financial stuff going on frictions a lot of frictions all you know 80 some odd percent have at least one kind of friction nominal rigidity market power search uh, completely totally widespread this is not news to anybody new keynesian dsg models are you know are dominant i was surprised to find that well, there's still a lot of our real business cycle style models, at least in the field journals, 20% uh, of, of, uh, of all the theory-based articles. Now the referees wanted us to look at some, uh, some of these more unconventional things, some of which I thought were a good idea, like heterogeneous agents, so that's really taken off. Uh, finite horizon, we're talking about overlapping generations models, those have like gone to almost zero. Not many models with indeterminacy, uh, and one of the things I wanted to look for, and the referee asked us to look for, is agent-based modeling. We looked for agent-based modeling, and we found like five. So uh, I think they're really cool, actually, but uh, they just never, they just never really take off. Uh, fitting method, we all kind of know uh, that optimization is becoming a thing, uh, and uh, uh, that's this document, this table. Now, on the econometric methods, I think this is, I think this is super interesting. And so what we've done is we've you know, we're classifying papers according to method and putting them in the like applied micro versus time series buckets, data structure closely related to that uh, cross section time series panel, uh, micro data skip that for a second and pr proprietary. We're also identifying papers that use, you know, data that you can't just get off the street, you have to pay for or know somebody at the BIS or something like that. Uh, so the message here. Uh, this is what we were talking about earlier. <laughs> time, plain straight ahead time series methods have been waning. So when I studied, when I was in graduate school, we were talking about like 80% time series, uh, now maybe 35% time series. And the flip side of this has been the growth of applied micro methods of one sort or another. And corresponding to that is also the rise of panel, use of panel data. A lot of panel data, a lot of applied micro kind of analysis being used in macro these days. Uh, which uh, I kind of suspected, but we just jumped out of this when we did these tabulations. And um, somewhat interestingly, but also distressingly, is that, the, is that the growing use of proprietary data, which is really cool. It's not just sort of stuff we're getting off the thread anymore, uh, you know, so, uh, but that does increase barriers to entry uh, to those of us uh, with small budgets at Little Arts Colleges, which is just too bad. A um, couple things here. Uh, one of the things that uh, we were asked about was whether uh, the amount of overlap between macro and uh, uh, people asked us about how much overlap is there between macro and other fields. And so we did an exercise the JEL codes to see how many uh, macro journals publish non macro articles and how many e articles publish uh, or cross listed with other codes. Just a couple of things to jump out here is that. A lot of the journals that we are calling macro journals, like the JME and the AEJ Macro, American Economic Journal of Macro, only two thirds of the papers are have the E designation. So a lot of the so in other words, the AEJ is publishing a lot of papers in development economics, or labor economics, uh, or applied micro. Forty percent of all articles are like applied micro, uh, listed in applied micro code. So. Applied micro articles are, well, not almost, but sort of rivaling uh, macro and monetary, uh, monetary codes in the AEJ macro. So I thought that was kind of, kind of telling. Uh, almost all papers have some JL code other than E. Most popular, not surprisingly, financial and micro. Least popular, international. So I was struck when we were doing this that the overwhelming majority of all the papers you're reading were closed economy, which I think is kind of interesting and, uh, I don't know, a, a little concerning, but uh, there you go. Last thing we did, do I have enough, uh, I'm going to go through this, yeah, I do want to spend some time on like the, the discussion summing up, so I'm going to go through this really uh, JE is not there. Yes, JE is not there. These are just exactly, these are just within the macro journals. That's true. 
So another question that uh, we were asked, we thought this was super interesting, is like, what was the life cycle and how do articles, how do ideas diffuse over time? And so what we did is we did a bunch of case studies of, art, of influential articles and wanted to see how those, how those evolved over time in terms of citations. And we documented that the typical citation pattern is for, you know, the paper to sort of gradually gain acceptance over 10 years and then kind of plateau in terms of the cumulative citations as a share of total uh, of the total articles in that journal. And uh, so this, this rise and then, then plateau, which kind of makes sense. What we thought was interesting is that there's so much, there's a lot of variation across these papers. And we see examples of papers like the Calvo paper and the, and the Taylor paper where, you know, nobody cited them for 10 years. In the case of Calvo paper, nobody cited them for like 15. Then all of a sudden they were discovered and they take off. They had some papers that when not many people were paying attention at first and then like Kiyotaki and more, and then over the years it's like, oh, this is really important. And the citations just keep growing. And then other papers that like get off to a strong start, like classic one is like the, the King Plaza Rubello paper on real business cycles. And then it has its day and then it kind of tapers off. So very different patterns and you definitely see the, the citation patterns echoing or paralleling the, the, the methodological and, uh, trends in the field. All right, so sorry I had to rush that. I apologize for getting, the, getting, getting wrong at the time. Uh, but finally, a slide on the takeaways. You know, so Reese has uh, asserted that uh, that macro is more than mindless G DSG modeling. Yeah, okay, it's definitely more than D mindless DSG modeling, uh, but it has been a convergence definitely towards that style of analysis. So this quantitative theory-based model, the quantitative DSG style analysis has really become the dominant uh, way of doing macro for, for better or for worse. Uh, and within that, you know, people do a lot of model fitting and a lot of quantification, very little hypothesis testing, surprisingly little abduction. So, uh, you know, so there's not a lot of, not a lot of kicking the tires of these models going on other than let's see if we can just fit the data. Traditional time series methods fading out, sadly, uh, and, uh, uh, and some of these other methods are coming in. So let me just step back if I have, if you can give me just another couple of minutes um, uh, to just to go into philosophy just a little bit. So this is like going way back in the day when I was in graduate school, when Warwick was in graduate school, and we were, this is like, uh, this is like the Lucas and Sargent, whereas this is where it was at. So when we were in graduate school, it's like, yeah, we're going to develop a business cycle model we can test. And we're going to keep testing it until we get it and rejecting it necessary and then until we get it right. And we're looking at Sarge, we're very strident about this. And, uh, uh, and that, was, that was sort of the way things were in, in the 1980s, early 1980s. Then by the time we get to 1996, Sims is saying it's like, well, okay, there are no true theories, there are no false theories. And so there's no point in trying to reject them. They're all kind of true. And it's just a question of how uh, well they reduce the data. Uh, so, it's like very, very, you know, here we are like 17 years later and this idea of falsification has completely been abandoned uh, by one of the, you know, thought leaders in the, in the field. And so that brings us to the question of like, okay, so we got a model that fits well. Uh, what does that tell us about, what, what do we learn from that? Going back to Edelman and Edelman, this is like my favorite paper. And they say, well, we did this great, we got this great fit. But we have to remember that doesn't, that doesn't mean the model is a good representation of the interactions, or it doesn't even mean the shocks we've identified are the main cause of the business cycle. So those, you know, those, the, the shocks are dependent on the, are model dependent too. So they're very modest in what they're, what they're claiming. Uh, if you ask me, a kind of modesty that is sort of lacking in today's, uh, in, in today's work. And Related to this, I saw there's this great paper by uh, John Taylor and Volker Bielen from a number of years ago. Uh, and I saw Volker present it and he was like very proud of this. He said, this is part of his effort to have this like bank of models that people can go uh, download and stimulate if they want. He said, yeah, you know, got these three models, Christian and I come Taylor and uh, uh, you know, Taylor model and the Smets and Otters model, they're all very different. But yeah, they, they all generate very, you know, they all generate the same impulse response functions. 
And then the thing that I, the quote that I should have had there is like, they have sim very similar impulse response functions, but very different implications for optimal policy. So I saw this paper like, oh man, I, I feel very uncomfortable now because we hear these models that are observationally equivalent for all intents and purposes fit the data equally well, but my policy re recommendation is going to depend critically on which of those models I think is correct. So I don't know, I didn't sleep that night. So anyway, uh, I'm going to throw in Deaton's. Uh, uh, this is kind of an interesting perspective too. So Deaton has uh, been getting down on the, the anguish uh causal effects literature uh, a lot, and uh, he's getting down on that literature because it's all about like seeing, you know, whether treatment X has an effect on outcome Y without really paying attention to the mechanisms. And so he's going on and saying, no, we have to look at the mechanism. And so this, this causal effect literature is, is not, is, is uh, well, it's not as no good, it's incomplete. So it struck me that, uh, you know, so in a sense, macro is subject to deep critique too, but inversely, in the sense that the mechanisms, we're very careful to write down the mechanisms in our microfinder models, but we don't spend a lot of time actually testing those mechanisms, uh, uh, putting, putting them under the microscope and uh, doing the testing part. Uh, so it's the, we have theory, theory without the testing and the experimentalists have like the, the, the causal effects without the, without the theory. And then the last slide, so we can talk about over beers, uh, whether we actually are a science at all. So, and I got a list of fun things to do in the future. Uh, and I'll just leave that uh, up there uh, because I am more than out of time and I'd like to get your reactions and questions. So thank you for listening. And I hope you thought there was as much, I hope you was, had as much fun uh, listening as I had in writing this monster of a paper. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ken. I think that was, uh, I mean, we could uh, spend all day listening because I think uh, you probably had a lot of fun working through this. Um, so it's, there are it's grueling. Things. It was like, grueling, but a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay, maybe we need to do this over even more than a beer. But uh, there, <laughs> there, are, but there are a few questions here that will probably take uh, less than a beer. But I think uh, we'll be good to get to them. So uh, on the Q and A, uh, Ole Ramel from the uh, CSEN Center asked, um, using machine learning, big data techniques on the more recent journals with available JEL codes, would you expect the classification to be the same? as the one from four humans well that's a good and this is this is a question we got actually from uh, other people and uh, I have to let the dog out and from the and from the referees and we thought about this a great deal and uh, so we read it we went back and read a bunch of papers and uh, and asked ourselves would we be able to how would is this something we'd be able to implement for you know people not knowing anything about exactly how this worked it's like, well, okay, so what if we had like a, some, some natural language processing algorithm, look for the words like reject or hypothesis or test and say, ah, well, anything that we have where you have those keywords and maybe some criteria for proximity with something else, anytime we have those, those, those words in conjunction somehow, then like, oh, great, this is a falsification paper. And then it's like, Oh, well, we tested for serial correlation uh, in the error term of this reduced form regression, or we reject the hypothesis that uh, of Granger causality uh, or Granger non causality. It's like, oh, well, these are tests of hypotheses, but these don't really qualify as tests of like the economic model. These are more like specification tests. So that kind of, we, we reached the conclusion that you know, maybe there would be, maybe if somebody better at this, you know, more imaginative than, than we were, would be able to devise a more subtle uh, way of distinguishing hypothesis testing on things other than keywords. But we, looking at this paper, we thought, well, how do we even, you know, without sort of an expert reading, how would we have made that different? How would we made that distinction? Or abduction, for example. So we have to figure out, we had, for some of the abduction papers, we have to read it very carefully to say, oh, well, because some of them will describe uh, what they're doing, not using the term null model. Do they use baseline model, benchmark, sometimes none of those terms. Standard policy, we have to like, well, okay, and then are they, are they rejecting it? Or are they proposing a modification? That requires often a very sort of a, a close reading of the paper and again, maybe some AI guy would be able to be able to codify that, but uh, you know, I I think I'd find myself uh, re rereading and checking uh, 
about a thousand of the two thousand papers uh, that the uh, that the AI algorithm would would be would be picking up. So yes, the answer really is like yeah, we we did consider that, um, but um, having uh, some some of these things are sufficiently subtle that I don't think I don't think that AI has or put it this way, the amount of time we spend training the AI would be far in excess of of uh, the the time saved uh, by the AI algorithm. Yeah, it's, good, it's a good um, question. Not the not the only one. Not the only time we got that. Yeah, so uh, Iqbal Majid has a question. Uh, I will just invite Iqbal to uh, turn on his camera and ask you the question. Uh, Iqbal, if you're there. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Um, sorry if my camera is working. Oh, here's the chat window. Iqbal. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Um, so I, I, I had a question that's quite related to. By the way, I was the one who asked the question earlier about the different uh, journals, the coverage of journals. But I had a question oh, yeah, relating yeah. to, um, you know, what what is your what is your view on the factors as to why the area of falsification or corroboration has actually um, been in decline? Right, it's actually quite rare from from uh, your mm -hmm. categorization, and I I just wanted to pose whether you think. Um, the statement or conclusion by uh, Katerina Jusilius, uh, who developed the, I mean, along with other authors, developed the um, um, co-integrated VAR model specifically for one purpose, which is to have uh, a sort of unified framework to empirically test and verify our theories to determine which should be abandoned and which to keep and then continually, continuously uh, do that, right? So you take a theory, you, you outline its testable hypotheses, and then you, you take a data-driven model and, and test it. And mm -hmm. that's how you, uh, you, you would test theories. But I mean, she mentioned something to the effect of, you know, the economist profession doesn't really have a unified framework to determine which theories to abandon and which to keep. So is that one of the reasons why you think um, falsification or, you know, corroboration, that area is in, is in decline? And, or maybe there are other factors as well. Just wanted to know your view. Yeah, you know, in, in some sense, I think the uh, I think the, the problem that macroeconomics has always, has struggled with uh, has always been the problem of identification. So, you know, in order to, in order to test a hypothesis, you need some essentially need some over identifying restriction. To put it, to put it you know, ultimately, that's what it's about. So. In a in in a world where everything is in, in macro, we just don't have enough instruments. We don't have enough uh, exogenous things to to uh, to provide the structural to you know, estimate the structural relationships and test the structural relationships. It's almost by default we've had to say, well, we're just going to impose essentially identifying assumptions and uh, sort of contingent on those assumptions. We'll just use as a criterion instead of statistical testing. This fit criterion as as the alternative. So I think ultimately it traces back to the identification problem uh, that uh, is is uh, I, I think at the core of it. And then maybe um, yeah. Uh, and then if you want to be like totally, I mean Larry Summers wrote this paper that I mentioned on like the second slide, the scientific illusion in macro. He basically said you know which is um, a little provocative, but whoever knew. I mean, Larry Summers is being provocative. Who knew that that was? <laughs> who, who knew that he could be provocative? But even in 1991, he's writing this paper basically saying, "Look, you know, econometrics is simply unable to uh, to reject these things. And even even when people do reject them, then people just still cling to them because they're um, uh, because they're convenient." So it's a complicated question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that if there's a single answer, but that um, I would. Uh, I would uh, describe it uh, in terms of, sort of ultimately an identification uh, issue. Econometrists right. can't accept them either, can't reject them, I can't accept them. Either. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, well, so very quickly, I think uh, James Molly has a, has a quick question. Um, we do have to wrap up soon, but um, we'll just invite James to just Okay, I just, it's it's uh, a great talk and fascinating, and I, I'll definitely read through the the paper. But sort of to follow up on what we talked about at the beginning about machine learning just being a, you know I guess um, uh, different language for what we've done before. Is it is it partly marketing? And we talk about panel data and 
uh, applied micro techniques in the AJ macro or so forth, when, when I look at a lot of the, you know, so-called say semi-structural modeling in uh, panel setting with household data, it's, it's a lot of it is just time series and unobserved components models that say you and I are familiar mm -hmm. with. Um, so, so do you think that it's really changes in methodologies away from time series or in macro, or is it just sort of rediscovering how you apply it to different types of data and then of course to to market it somewhat differently given mm. that the audience might be broader and include my applied micro well i think i think there is actually a a, a substantive difference is that we do make a, a subtle distinction in the paper between time series uh, methods and uh, or uh, applied micro methods uh, and time series methods and uh, time series data and uh, time series methods is time and uh, cro and cross sectional um, uh, sort of micro data and uh, so the difference is so you know the the applied micro techniques uh, are things that essentially if you, you know, panel techniques you want to think of it as like you know something that would involve that would involve the large n small t econometrics and so when you talk about applied micro methods and panel data it's like large and small t panel data. There are panel data sets that are like by country, you know, so like panel time series. And so those would be like, uh, those would be like panel data, but time series methods. So you do see a lot of those, but the, where we really see the growth is in the use of like the large and small t panel data uh, methods applied to macro topics. So it's uh, we we make that subtle distinction, and I think that that distinction we make is able to 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 get at your question. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, so I think uh, we are a little bit over time. I mean, it's a very fascinating talk, and I said uh, I think uh, Ken can educate us more when we see him in a in a pub over many many drinks in the future. <laughs> but uh, I I just want to thank uh, Ken for his time and uh, also um, Rene for uh, and Kama for setting all all the logistics up. It has been uh, it's been great and uh, and it's, uh, of course uh, Jose at the CSEN Center who is on your screen here. I think it was really fun to um, do something all together. So uh, once again, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully on this show someday. Um, great. Yeah. Well, and thank you. I really enjoyed uh, it. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I really had a great time uh, and I appreciate Ken. your comments. Thank you, Ken and Ben and Ozera James.